Previously, we spoke about the link between disruptive innovation and entrepreneurship, and the fact that disruptive innovation is often undertaken by entrepreneurs who can challenge the status quo. We also spoke about entrepreneurs' motivation. In this lesson, we're going to explore entrepreneurship in more detail. What are the attributes of successful entrepreneurs and why serial entrepreneurs are often successful? Before we discuss what we know about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, I want to dispel some common misconceptions or myths about both that are often raised when I tell people I'm a professor of entrepreneurship. The first myth is the adage that entrepreneurs are born, not made. In other words, you're either born as an entrepreneur or you're not. And that nothing can change your propensity to be an entrepreneur or your likelihood of entrepreneurial success. In reality, being entrepreneurial is not a one-zero dichotomy. The population's entrepreneurial aptitude, whatever that is, but for now we'll just say it's a measure of entrepreneurial potential, can be viewed as a standard distribution, with some people more entrepreneurial and some people less. In the next part of this lesson, we'll introduce and discuss various aspects of entrepreneurial aptitude. The second myth is that you cannot learn to be an entrepreneur. While there are elements of this statement that are true, you can learn to be more entrepreneurial. In other words, to think like an entrepreneur. You can also learn about entrepreneurship and develop knowledge that can either increase your likelihood of entrepreneurial success or reduce the likelihood of entrepreneurial failure. In fact, this is the prime motivation for creating this course. This course in Innovation, Creativity, Entrepreneurship starts by helping you to reflect on your own behaviours, to learn about yourself, and then to understand what motivates you and how you operate, all in order to improve your entrepreneurial aptitude. In addition, the course is also about entrepreneurial science and the behavioural aspects of creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship. This in order to increase your likelihood of entrepreneurial success, or again, to reduce your likelihood of failure. For instance, trying to create a new product without some direct evidence that it solves a user problem is unlikely to result in a successful business. Although I can't count the number of times that people have come to me trying to do this. The third myth of entrepreneurship is about risk-taking, and entrepreneurs are people who take big risks. In reality, gamblers take big risks by betting money on an outcome over which they have no control. In contrast, entrepreneurs take moderate risks because they always believe, rightly or wrongly, that they can have some direct impact on the likelihood of success, or at the very least, they can mitigate the likelihood of failure. An entrepreneur launching a new business believes they have the resources or the expertise to reduce the market or technology risk. This is quite different from the gambler who has no control whatsoever over the outcome and just believes they can beat the system. The gambler is taking on the much bigger risk. The fourth myth of entrepreneurship is that starting a business comes, involves coming up with a business plan and then attracting investors. In some cases, this myth is exacerbated if the intent of the business plan is to attract funding from a venture capitalist. That's a private funding organization that invests other people's money in your venture in return for equity. Companies such as Anderson Harrods, Sequoia Capital and Kleiner Perkins Cofield. This view of entrepreneurship is problematic for three main reasons. Most early stage companies are funded by the entrepreneur and their friends and family, not by investors. In addition, most companies start by focusing on getting a first customer, both to validate the opportunity and to provide evidence for a potential investor in the future, not by developing a plan. And also, it's important to understand that seeking equity funding means that you're eventually going to sell the business because the investor needs to make a return on their investment. Yet most people starting a business don't start out with this view. The fifth myth of entrepreneurship, in part linked to that previous myth, is the myth that you need to develop this detailed plan before you start a business. While you do need a plan, the first stage of developing a business is finding a customer or finding a problem or meeting a need. In the words of Steve Blank, you need to explore 
before you exploit. Entrepreneurship has been defined as the capacity and the willingness to develop, organize and manage a business venture along with any of its risks in order to make a profit. Increasingly, the definition of entrepreneurship has been expanded to include social entrepreneurship, corporate entrepreneurship. These include developing and organizing, but don't include that profit motive. However, that does not mean that social entrepreneurs can operate businesses at a loss. It's just that money made is plowed back into the venture and there are no shareholders. In the words of a well-known entrepreneurship professor, not for profit often means not for long. If the venture is not earning enough money to invest or reinvest in required resources, it will soon fail. One well-known social entrepreneur is Mohamed Yunus, who founded the Greenland Bank in 1976 to lend small amounts of money to entrepreneurs in Bangladesh. He's known as the father of microcredit and established the microfinance movement, which aims to help millions of entrepreneurs become business starters. In the process, he won the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. Corporate entrepreneurs, sometimes known as intrapreneurs, also differ from traditional for-profit entrepreneurs, as they operate within larger organizations, developing products or services, creating new divisions that create new value for customers. The main difference between them and traditional entrepreneurs is that they don't take on the personal risks and the associated rewards. Instead, these both accrue to the business. I've discussed what entrepreneurs do and the link with action, risk and rewards. But are all for-profit entrepreneurs the same? Bill Gartner says the answer is definitely no. Entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes. They all have all kinds of different motivations for what they do. Oftentimes they get into business for very, very different reasons than other ones. Some people get into business because they want the money. Some people want to get into business because they want to save the world. Some people go on and get into business because they love the kinds of products and services they provide. It's really hard to parse out this unique characteristic that makes every individual um, special as an entrepreneur. Perhaps one of the reasons that we cannot identify specific characteristics of a for-profit entrepreneur is that there are actually many different types of for-profit entrepreneurs. So grouping them all together to identify common behaviors is almost impossible. Let me briefly introduce these four different types of for-profit entrepreneur. This will help explain why it's difficult to aggregate entrepreneurial behavior. And let's start with the most common type of entrepreneur, although often not the one that's seen as a high-profile entrepreneur, the lifestyle entrepreneur. Lifestyle entrepreneurs who do what they love, in the process able to support themselves and their family, often by necessity, create businesses out of their passion. For example, if your passion is surfing, you open up a surf shop, or you offer surf lessons, or you start a blog on surfing. Pat Flynn is a great example of a lifestyle entrepreneur, and is extremely transparent about his business, to the benefit of those wanting to follow in his footsteps. For example, he openly shares his monthly income reports on his smart passive income website and has an extremely popular podcast where he shares what he's learned from running several online businesses. Pat trained as an architect, but as he recounts in his book, Let Go, was laid off before his career could even get started. Fortunately, he had a lot of success with the first ever website he set up to help people pass a notoriously difficult architect exam. By putting together and selling an ebook on the same topic, he was able to earn over $7,000 in the first month and continues to earn money on that ebook to this day. He now says that being laid off was the best thing to ever happen to him. Without my nine to five job holding me back, I've since been able to earn more money and work less hours and with more flexibility. This has allowed me to be home and spend more time with my family. The next most common entrepreneur is the solopreneur. These are typically freelancers and contractors who are self-employed, independent and self-reliant. They don't employ others and usually have some technical expertise that lets them earn revenue. This often includes consultants and advisors or people working for larger companies on an individual basis.
The third type of entrepreneur is the small business owner, often a service business, such as a restaurant or a graphic design shop. But it can be a small manufacturing business. These companies are by design and by nature limited in size, but they do provide a valuable service to customers and a fulfilling role for the founder. Finally, there are the high growth entrepreneurs, often linked to the creation of a scalable business that relies on technology. The point of technology is that it's difficult to scale without a unique technology or business model. It is usually this type of entrepreneur, such as Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, or Mark Zuckerberg, that are seen as the role model for entrepreneurs. Despite the fact that so few entrepreneurs operate in these types of environments as high growth entrepreneurs. There are a number of characteristics though that are typical of this type of technology entrepreneur. They understand the technology, they have a strong leadership ability, and most importantly, a high aspiration level. They're also willing to surrender control of the ventures to their investors and shareholders. These types of entrepreneurs often engage in startup one after another, and they're defined as serial entrepreneurs.